Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And today on the show, I'm pleased to introduce you to Roy Hill. Roy Hill obtained his bachelor's degree in psychology at the University of Arizona and his doctorate degree in clinical psychology at Nova Southeastern University. He has worked as a psychologist in corrections, both as a clinician and supervisor for over 20 years. Following several life-changing experiences, Roy delved into the topic of near-death experiences. He has authored a book following his immersion called Psychology and the Near-Death Experience, Searching for God, which was published by White Crow Books. As his mission and passion, Roy is currently writing more books and speaks regularly on the topic of near-death experience. And when not writing, Roy enjoys hiking, photography, and tinkering on the piano, he says, and he lives in Colorado with his wife and son. Roy Hill, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you very much, Sandra. I'm very pleased to be here. Oh, I'm pleased to have you. And for our listener, this is episode 98. You can go to wedontdieradio.com and see who Roy is, and we'll have all the links to everything on this episode. Roy, I'm thrilled because we've been exchanging several emails back and forth, so I'm happy we got to make this work. Um, If you're willing, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you went... Oh, my gosh. There's, I know there's a lot to say, but if, if this was something that was always an interest of yours or, or how you got involved in the whole world of near-death experiences and maybe even psych- psychology. Well, Sandra, this topic of near-death experiences is a bit out of my character, at least from the past. I grew up in a very scientific household. Both my brother and father are physicists and my mom is a geologist. So I also grew up in the Baptist church, so I had this religious background. I had become a little bit interested in near-death experiences in college after reading Raymond Moody's book. Yes. Um, So, but something really changed, a transformative watershed event. About 16 years ago, I was working in a federal prison And I had an inmate who uh, had some mental illness, um, depression with psychotic features, and his sister had passed away. And his sister, um, he he was close to his sister and was a good support for him while in prison. So I knew he was going to have some difficulties. Indeed, when I saw him, he was hearing voices and very depressed. So I placed him on suicide watch because he was also reporting command auditory hallucinations to kill himself. So the first day, there wasn't much change. Second day, he said he was completely better. And I thought, why now? How can he be completely better? And so I asked him. He says, well, my sister's talking to me. And she's telling me that I shouldn't be here and that I need to uh, live my life productively and not to worry about her because she's in a better place and so forth. So after that, I thought about it. That's not your typical psychotic reaction. Usually voices are negative and cryptic and frankly, never helpful. Right. That's right. So I um, took him off watch because his mental status looked good with the promise that I would see him the next morning. So I saw him the next morning, and he said that his uh, sister was still talking to him. I said, well, what is she saying? He goes, well, she's telling me you don't believe me. (laughs) And so that you shall believe she has a message for you. And so you can imagine that I started getting goosebumps. You just gave me goosebumps. Yeah. Yes, yes. This is way out of my experience and understanding of the spiritual realm. Because in the Baptist tradition, hearing things from 
uh, deceased loved ones was demonic. Mm -hmm. So, but I didn't believe that. Um, I said, well, what is she telling you? And he said, she's telling me quarter. I thought to myself, what does that mean? So I asked him, does she mean like a quarter of the coin or a quarter of something else? So he begins talking to her to ask that, and he comes back and he says, she says quarter of the coin. I said, very confused, what does that mean? I, said, I don't know. She won't tell me. So he leaves, and this white Muslim comes next, and he uh, kind of ranting around uh, about the hypocrisy of the United States, and I was barely listening to him when he looks at me in the eye and says, Dr. Hill, do you know what's written on a quarter? And automatically I said, in God we trust. He goes, that's right. Wow. Right, and so nobody's asked that to me, of me, before or since. And this happened like 20 minutes later. So I knew this message from this deceased sister was probably real. So of course I bring the first guy in back and I told him what happened and he seemed surprised. I said, well, does your deceased sister tell you anything else? And he said, yeah. She's telling me that your wife is pregnant, you're gonna have a son, he'll be born on Christmas Day. That's pretty specific. That's very specific. These are things that can be verified. Well, I knew my wife was pregnant and I knew she was gonna have a son. It is possible that the inmate overheard staff mention that. Right. They're not supposed to, so it's very unlikely. They're not supposed to talk about other staff in front of inmates, but it's still possible. So really the crux of the matter rested on, would my son be born on Christmas day? Well, he was born on January 7th. So many years later, I was wondering about this and I think, wow, you know, everything else were, seemed to be so, so right. Why was this, why did this part not fit? And it was another institution 11 years later and I was, um, walking back to my office and I just had this epiphany. I thought to myself, well, first there was a declaration I didn't have faith. And secondly, there was a declaration that I needed to trust in God. So maybe this was a test of faith. So in the leap of faith, I Googled Christmas day and January 7th, knowing full well, as everybody does, Christmas day is December 25th. Well, lo and behold, a lot of stuff came up. Turns out we use the Roman calendar, the Julian calendar, but Christianity used to use the Gregorian calendar or the Christian calendar. And even to this day, the Orthodox churches, the Russian Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, still use the Christian calendar. And according to the Christian calendar, Christmas Day is January 7th. So, my son was born on Christmas Day. I, I, was, I was flooded with goosebumps when you said January 7th, because I had actually heard that before. Oh, okay. And that's wild. It is wild. Wow. And beyond, it is not only wild, but it is beyond coincidence. Of course. So, at that point... I knew that spirituality and the things out there went beyond my Baptist upbringing. And if I were to go to Christian friends and ask them about this experience, they would just say, oh, well, that's day doc, you know, that's probably just from the devil. Right. I didn't need that kind of feedback. It wasn't helpful. So I turned to the place that I knew, talked about spiritual beings, and that was from near-death experiences. So I went to the NDERF website, which is the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation, where they have currently about 4,000 anonymous near-death experiences. And I started reading them voraciously. It was like this big puzzle. All the pieces started fit together. 
and uh, and everything made sense. And this deep spiritual knowledge, um, you know, was in those stories, and it created awakening in me and an excitement, a spiritual excitement I never felt before. I started corresponding to the Longs, uh, who uh, run the website, and. Uh, uh, Jody Long encouraged me to write a book, and here I am. And I recently retired uh, from 20 years of law enforcement service as a psychologist um, to do this full time. Wow. That's where, that's how I got started and where I'm at today. Congratulations. What is the website Thanks. about the, did you say NDE? rf.com is that what it yes uh -huh. okay. yes yes ma'am mm -hmm. good to know that, that that's out there right right and um they have uh several hundred special um reports in addition to, to thousands of, of others so people don't have a lot of time to go through all of them like i did uh there are um some ones that they may want to and special attention to. Um, but anyway, it's a great, great website. Did you, Roy, just get totally lit up when you got, when you started delving into this? I did. I did. I, I became lit up, excited. And over time, I do believe that my life had become transformed. Um, not in an immediate sense. Uh, nor um, in a complete sense, I am still a human being of course. who struggles with the things that everybody else does. And I still have my faults and my quirks, as I'm sure my family would um, attest to. But I do believe that I found a sense of repose, which I think very much goes in line with the theme of your radio podcast. And repose is sort of a dignifying peace, even in the face of adversity, even knowing that death may sometime come. It's to release that anxiety of death, to release the anxiety that comes with earthly attachments, and uh, to let go and to become at peace. I believe that's probably the greatest transformative consequence of this journey that I've embarked. Yeah, sure. Uh, would you talk a little bit about, the, from the 4,000 things you've studied, maybe some commonalities? I, I know um, we're all human, and, and it's a nice reminder to hear some of these things to really help us believe that we go on. Um, so any commonalities yeah. in the near-death experience that you realized? Well, first of all, uh, maybe you could speak a little bit about how you were convinced that this goes more than just somebody's imagination uh, when they die or just a, something to do with their brain shutting down, like that this is actually a real thing, that these experiences okay. are real. All right, to um, address that, that that's, um, I'll, I'll try to keep that answer brief because I could go on and on about evidence for the near-death experience. Unlike religious traditions, which I have the most respect for, uh, one of the big differences with the near-death experience is, is that there are common themes, and this is verified through research, including the lawns, and other people as well, that the core themes are the same regardless of age, culture, religion, language, gender, whatever. Whatever you can think of, the core elements are the same. Um, that's one line of evidence. Now, there are cultural differences in the superficial things that people have experienced. For instance, a Native American, he passed away and he saw a school bus. He went onto that school bus and there was elders having a peyote ceremony. Okay. Very, very culturally specific. Yet, when he touched the edge of the school bus, he could feel 
the interconnection and love of all life. And those things are the same, regardless of anybody having a near-death experience. So it's in a great intelligence, a, a purpose, an eternal being, love and mission and interconnection and unity. All of these elements were present for him, just as it is for anyone. So that's one line of evidence that I think convinced me that these are real. Also, the sheer number. Um, anywhere from 3 to 7% of people uh, where there's been surveyed, Europe, United States, Canada, and Australia primarily, have had near-death experiences. So in the United States alone, that's 15 million people. Wow, I had no had, idea the number was so high. It's incredibly high. And so when you have that level of reliability, it's amazing. So if you're in a court of law, right, and somebody accused you of shoplifting, mm -hmm. if you had one person say, yeah, I saw her shoplift, and that was the only evidence, it would probably be thrown out. Two people, you know, maybe. Maybe, yeah. If you had four or five, you're probably going to get convicted. We've got 15 million people say, she shoplifted then any jury or judge is going to say, yeah, we know it for a fact. So I think this kind of numbers really support the near-death experience. Also, there are a lot of other lines of evidence. For instance, um, there's no really explanation for people to have these experiences in a dying or dead brain. So these neurological uh, suggestions are just, I think, wild theories. Right. Some people say it's an evolution, evolutionary thing. Well, what's the evolutionary advantage for a person to have a positive near-death experience in a dying brain? How does that help the individual or the species? Exactly. Right. And so, you know, the neurological um, person dies. That people are having these ex long extended experiences that they say are real or more real. And all these pseudoscience experiences, yet there is research su supporting the near-death experience. For instance, when people go out of their bodies, they can describe the operation, uh, what the doctors did, and there's mm -hmm. been experiments saying that. Blind people from birth, people who cannot see, are unable to describe visual stimuli because they have never experienced those stimuli before. That's mind-blowing. So, Mind it is, but once, but if they have a near-death experience, then they can, right? Because they're not blind when they go up or out. <laughs> yeah, I, I've and, talked to a number of people. Sorry to interrupt you uh, on this show oh. that have had the near-death experience, and so many of them remember it like it was just yesterday, more clear than even what they had for breakfast this morning. And I think that's Precisely. incredible, that, that level of clarity. And they say also, you know, when we wake up from a dream and here we are waking up in our bed, we say, oh, yeah, that was just a dream. Uh, many of them have also said that when they came back to their earthly body, um, where they went made Earth seem like just a dream. Exactly. And they're, they know they, they don't have organs like we do, like eyes and ears. They're really energy. We're all energy up there. We can manifest ourselves in, in, in ways that are familiar. Right. But our true essence is energy. And so we sense things by knowing things. And by knowing things, we know it purely. And so that's why it's realer than real. Because uh, from a psychologist, and as I write in my book, if you, if you look out, really about 70% of your vision is blurry only about the 30 percent in the middle that's in focus hmm. and you know in, in our hearing and in, in our eyesight and our smell and everything is being clouded by imperfect organs physical organs um, and our brain itself as Evan Alexander said is a reducing valve and so when we're up there we don't have the brain to limit us we're interconnected with everything and so our thoughts are clear and we can know anything anytime we want we're greatly expanded when we 
talk to each other. We talk through telepathy, but it's not even really telepathy. It's by knowing the person's experiences and emotions and feeling them purely. So it's a very, very different existence in that sense, a very expanded existence. We're really, truly magnificent spiritual beings here living in a reduced in a reduced capacity uh, to learn what learn what we lack. More about that. Sure. So, if you and your listeners ever wondered, what is the meaning of life? I'm I'm wondering that, and I ask right. a lot. I mean, people people <laughs> people have been. People have been wondering that for thousands of years and writing about it and speculating. Mm -hmm. But uh, here for a treat, I have an answer. For oh, I'm glad. <laughs> and it comes from people who have near-death experiences. Okay. What they say is that we come to school to learn. Uh, school Earth to learn. Let me back up. We, uh, what near-death experience people say that we were spiritual beings for a long time, and we will be for a long time. So why would a spiritual being ever come down to earth to be limited where there's pain and mm. suffering or what have you? Right. Well, let's look at the converse. When we're at home, so to speak, in heaven, if you will, we are interconnected to the divine. So all the negative emotions we experience down here really are not present. There's no conflict. There's no death. There's no sickness. There's no pain. We know things so we don't have anxiety. It's a wonderful, wonderful place to feel bliss. But it's not a good place to become individuals, to make choices by our own free will to become who we are through our own experiences, good and bad. So we come down to planet Earth for a short time where we do have choices. We're disconnected. We learn through not only good things, but adversity, sometimes best through adversity. And we're all given two or three missions to do. Um, and those missions involve to learn what we lack. And usually that involves learning how to love in some way. I'm not talking about love so much as a feeling, but love as skill sets. And I go quite a bit in my book about what skill sets mean as a psychologist. So forgiveness, for instance, mm, is a crazy. subset of love. But forgiveness is hard. Yes, it's easy to forgive a friend who may have said an unkind word by accident. But what about forgiving somebody who's really hurt you? maybe um, a former spouse who cheated on, on you or somebody's really hurt you in some way. That is difficult to forgive. And so sometimes some of us are placed on earth to be in situations where we need to forgive. Sacrifice is another area. It's easy to sacrifice for you know, uh, maybe uh, somebody who needs a hand across the street with some groceries, an elderly lady or whatever. But what about taking care of your mother or father who has Alzheimer's disease? Mm -hmm. You have to quit your job and watch them decline and die. That element of sacrifice is very, very difficult. And we don't learn those things up there. We learn things down here where things are a mess. They sure are. And that, they are. But that's good because we, God shines through our cracks. I think that's very important for people to know. God the shines idea, through our cracks. I've never heard yeah. that, and that's lovely. It comes from an NDE report I read. Uh, some um, lady learned that from her NDE. She said, God shines through my cracks, meaning that, um, that the idea is not to be perfect. And, and, and we're all messed up with this notions of sin, that God doesn't like us because we made this mistake or that mistake. I'd like people to reframe that in their mind, that we're actually 
learning through our mistakes. And that's why we're down here in the first place. You brought a smile to my face. I, I can think of some horrible mistakes I've made and also some times of real suffering. And yeah. looking back, had they not happened the way they'd had, I would not be where I am today. And I think exactly when we're in the midst of suffering or if you just lost a loved one recently or whatever's happening for you, it's hard to see it as a gift. And sometimes it does take it is. being years down in the, in the future to look back and go, wow. So sometimes all we can do is trust. I love that you said, what's on a quarter? And God, we trust. Sure would be nice to have the That's answers right. all the time, Roy. But it, it would, it would. And I learned, you know, I had enough faith to take him off suicide watch, but I didn't have complete faith. And so what was taught to me was partial faith is not really true faith. And... W- when the whole purpose behind your show is to teach people not to fear death. And even people who believe in God uh, through their religious traditions, that helps with faith, but still a lot of people have their doubts. And I think the beautiful thing about near-death experiences is that people really learn that way too much fuss is being made over death. That's that. funny, actually. That sounds In funny. fact, they're actually told that. Many people are told that by their spiritual beings mm-hmm. up there, that too much has been made out of death. So think of this. So you have these indie ears, some of them who were very fearful of death before they died. Some were atheists or agnostics. Some maybe had religious beliefs, but still had their doubts, and they lived their lives fearing death. So that created anxiety in their lives, and it kept them from living through their whole potential, and some people may have been a little bit adrift because of this fear. Right. So how ironic it is, when they die, they go up there. They know that they're at home, and they feel this incredible love from all the beings they meet and from the fabric of everything. You could call it God, if you will. And it's just pervading love. Some people say it's like being in a swimming pool of love. Wow. One, one NDE person said, if I added all the love that you've ever had in your life that did not compare to just a moment of love up there. That's and the wild. peace. Yeah. Yeah, it's wild. And and so guess what? Some of them are told, um, you gotta go back. You have more work to do. Mm-hmm. And the work then harkens back to what I was saying about we're on school earth. We're here to learn things. So they said, You gotta go back. You're not finished yet. You'll be back soon but you got more work on earth. How do you think those people react? They don't want to, they don't well. want to, no, it feels they good don't where I am. Back. They don't, they kick and scream and have a tantrum, not literally kick and scream, but they have a bit of a tantrum and they argue and they desperately don't want to come back, but they do. Okay. Sometimes they're shown that they have their mission with their kids or family or what, what, what have you. But isn't that ironic Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that these people fear death so much that here on earth that that, that, that they kind of are not living to their full potential because of that fear? And when they go up there and told to come back, they have a tantrum because they don't want to come back? Roy, I talked to a race car driver who had had a near-death experience in his younger days, and he was very secretive about it. Not many people know this about him, and you know I haven't broadcast who he is, but he said that um, he had flatlined at an operating table after being in a car crash, and he said that he opened his eyes and his grandmother and grandfather were there in a world that seemed more yeah. real than this one, colors that 
we don't have on, on this plane of existence. And he said he knew what had happened and he knew that he was fine. And he had a moment to hover over his body and realize his mom and dad and brother were praying for him. And so he, had, he knew he had a choice. He'd be fine either way, go with Graham and Gramps uh, or come back to earth. And he, he knew the right thing to do was to come back to earth. And he, although he opened his eyes in a lot of pain physically, he no longer had that fear of dying. And he said without the fear of dying, he didn't have the fear of living. So as a race car driver, he won more championships than most people because he said, I wasn't afraid to put my foot all the way down on the pedal and race and live. And when he told me that story, it, it just made me think that if through a radio show or through our books or something that we can take away that fear of dying which can take away the fear of living and and it sounds like the same thing you're speaking out about is just to really Absolutely. play full out on our life not necessarily go 200 miles an hour in a car but whatever those risks you are want to take go for it or those undelivered communications or whatever that fear is you know step into it go for it go for your dreams Right. 99% of what people are, um, you know, uh, experience is fear. Mm. And that really impacts people's lives very, very much. And um, so, absolutely. Anything from um, your background about dealing with fear for us? Because I, I tell you, as much as I believe in life after death and I feel most alive when I'm having these conversations, but then all of a sudden fear strikes and it's like everything I know gets put on the back burner and I sometimes I get stopped. Um, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think for me, this journey that I'm taking um, is a risk, something that I may have not done before. I had a safe government job. And I'm basically giving up that security, the money, what have you, to write a book, promote it uh, with faith that it's going to do okay. Oh, right. And so, right, right. So for me, it was more important to do that uh, than let my fear of not having enough money or what have you uh, get in my way. And indeed... This is what a lot of indie ears uh, are, are reporting, that people are consumed with fear, and, and it could be just fear of, of, of losing a job or fear of whatever. And, and, and true, those are, are real fears. And I fear that truck. I don't want to get run over by that truck. No. Right. So fear is, has an adaptive functioning. And it's good, but too much of our lives are surrounded by fear, and we don't even know it. We don't know how much of our behavior is really driven by fear. A lot of the violence and prejudices and ugliness we see in the world have, it, have their roots in fear. So, anyhow, mm. um, yeah, so I, I think if people can lose their fear, starting with the fear of death, and they're going to be able to accomplish their mission so much better. Mm -hmm. I, had, I had another question for you that just showed up on my horizon. Sure. Do many of the people that have had near-death experiences see angels or see their deceased loved ones? I know there's nothing that I would like to picture more that when my day comes that my dad and my grandmother are there to greet me. Do people share about that? Oh, Sandra, yes, they do. Every near-death experience is unique. And a near-death experience is obviously short. And I would say not even near-death experience is a very good ter term. I prefer the term brief death experience because people die unless they're in a coma. People do have similar experiences in a coma. Mm -hmm. um, but... I think everybody will quickly see their loved ones when they pass away or transition, I think is a better word. But people who have near-death experiences, about three-quarters of them 
see somebody up there. Uh, sometimes it's a spiritual being, and sometimes it is a deceased relative. Somewhere about 40% of people actually see deceased loved ones. Uh, grandparents are the most common. Nice. Unless the person is older, because, because, you know, people's parents may have not passed on yet. Right. By the way, that's another evidence for the near-death experiences is that people only see deceased loved ones when they go up there. If it were a dream or hallucination, you would think they would see people in their lives, but they don't. They only see deceased loved ones. Interesting. And the deceased loved ones come to them and they say, I love you, I miss you so much, and I'm with you all the time. So I love you and I'm with you and I miss you. So all those things they communicate. Um, many of those deceased loved ones become our spiritual guides, according to people who have near-death experiences. They're actually truly with us. Mom, who you may have, have passed away and you were close to and you miss her so much, actually probably knows you better than she did when she was living because she knows your thoughts and your emotions and, and everything and she is truly with you all the time um, now things are different up there there's a level of multitasking and uh, and so forth so it's not like all of heaven is being with loved ones down here mm -hmm. because they can have different streams of consciousness at once, which is a whole nother topic. But That's the point is, yeah. it is, it is, it's, it's, it's kind of mind blowing. Uh, but the point, important point is, is that our loved ones are truly with us and they miss us and they love us completely. And for those who are spiritually guiding us, are guiding us through the gentle nudge. What does that mean? What does that mean? I like that, the gentle nudge. Well, very few of us actually see our deceased loved ones, although some people do. Most of the time, they influence us through uh, an inspiration, a feeling, a thought, oftentimes that we think are our own. But it's really them trying to kind of nudge us. Now, there's one maxim up there is that free will is always preserved. So people have the right to choose what they want to choose. So it's not like we're puppets down here. We always have the free will to choose what we want in our lives, no matter how self-destructive it is. Uh, we can choose that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are given some guidance, and those who are open to that guidance are probably open to receive more of it. That's wonderful. So, so we all do have guides. As, as much as I'd like to believe, I'm just sitting here alone. And very much, I think many of us can feel terribly alone in our life. We can have confidence that they might be invisible, but we are supported and we have guides. Absolutely. We are never alone. We are never alone. Mm. We're never, and, ever alone. And I'm sure that love that everyone feels with the near-death experience, if we were able to tap into it, we are probably just as loved here sitting wherever we are by so much love that we can't see. We are all loved. Yes, and, and let me speak a little more to that mm -hmm. because I think this is very important. So many people feel that they don't deserve to be loved. And what the near-death experience teaches us is that God and spiritual beings love every single person equally. We all have equal value. That doesn't mean that we have all the same level of spiritual maturity. But think about it. Don't you love your teenage daughter or son the same as you would as your toddler daughter or son? Mm -hmm. Now, the toddler is going to reach for that frosted cupcake because that toddler has not learned to control his or her impulses. So he's going to reach for the frosted cupcake, get his face all messy, even when he's not supposed to or she's not supposed to. But we still love that toddler the same. 
because that toddler has inherent worth as their son or daughter. And we're all sons and daughters of God. Some of us are more spiritually mature in our journey Mm -hmm. than others. But that doesn't matter. We're still loved the same. So there was this one woman who had a near-death experience. And she was in a garden, which many people are, uh, when they cross over, created for us. And in that garden, um, she came across God. And God looked like kind of a nice gentleman. How does God really look like that? Of course not. God is an energy throughout the whole universe. But that's how God came across to her to put her at ease. Right. To give her the information she needed to know. And God asked her, what if it was just you and me and nobody else? And she goes, well, what do you, what do you mean? What is it? What if it was just you and me and nobody else? And she said, well, you would probably get tired of me. I'd just be yakking on and on and get tired of me going on and on like that. <laughs> and so God asked again, what if it was just me and you and nobody else? Now look at that tree over there. There was a tree in the garden. It was just shining with energy and perfection. And she could see everything at the microscopic molecular level. And and she answered, well, I see you in that tree, God. He says, that's right. And what about your parents? She thought about it. She says, well, I see you, God, too. Hmm. And he goes, what about your your mean ex-husband? And then she reluctantly said, I see you in him as well. And then she says, well, who do you see in the mirror? And she wanted to say, nobody special. Right. But then she knew that was the wrong answer. And she said, I see you, God. And she says, that's right. So the message of that near-death experience report was that God is in all of us and loves us so much that it could just be us and God and nobody else. And that's how much God loves us. That's an incredible. Each one of us. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to look at somebody who's causing us pain and see God in them. But again, if we can look from the lens of our own growth. And some people even say, you know, that people have signed up to play certain roles so we have this growth. Who knows? Um, I wanted to ask you too, Roy, is there, I haven't read the 4,000 near-death experiences like you have. (laughs) However, when people return, do they have a need Does their life change? Do they have a need to help other people? Typically, yes. Uh, People have different levels of near-death experiences and it impacts them differently. But typically, a lot of people have a need uh, to help other people because that is what the basis of love is. It's other-centered instead of me-centered. In this world, everything I said everything, but a lot of this world involves about the me. Yes, it is. Yep. To to build a monument to ego, to get a little piece of fame. All that goes away. The path of ego is, is self-destructive because we lose things that we build up in life. And if, if we don't do it during life and we die and we lose it anyway, and so when people get older, if they're wealthy or and have power and they start losing that power as they get older, then they try harder and harder to maintain it. And then they became very fearful of death because all the little illusionary things that they create in their lives, they realize are going to come to end and they can't stand that because that's all they have. That's right. all they created. And so death becomes very fearful from a near-death experience what we experience is all about mission, to learn how to love, and then we go home. 
when we finish our semester of this difficult class here on Earth, we go home. So we're like a boarding school. And so people who have near-death experiences realize what their mission is. It's to love other people. It's to learn. It's to help. And it's to create a better planet. So obviously, people are who come back, many of them, uh, do do try to focus on helping other people. Many of them quit their jobs and find something more service oriented. Mm-hmm. Um, others volunteer more, and a lot of people don't judge other people as much. And all those things are are really important. And we don't so I, have to have a near death experience to do those things. Correct. We don't. Take a look at me. I have not had a near-death experience. But here I am talking to you about these things because I learned from who I call our ambassadors from heaven. And how much joy and purpose do you feel by your mission being loving and sharing? Well, a tremendous amount. At the beginning of the broadcast... I talked about repose, and I think that comes from my connection, more con- being more connected with the vine, focusing on love, focusing on others more than I had in the past, not that I'm perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm much further down on that journey than I used to be. Mm-hmm. And because of that, I have felt less anxiety, less fear, less anger, and more at peace. And my philosophy is be passerby. And that actually comes from a verse that uh, from the Gospel of Thomas, which is not in the Bible, but Jesus reportedly said that. Um, but anyway, I like, I like that, that um, that message. What does that mean? Be, be passer- passerby? Passive. Yes. To be passerby means to go throughout life as a visitor. You uh-huh. don't form any attachments to anything in the material. You interact with it. You don't put yourself in a monastery and try to shut out the world. You're part of the world, but you don't attach yourself to the world. You're like a visitor. You're being passerby. <sighs> And without all these attachments, that frees a person up, frees the anxiety, and allows them to move forward in peace, in repose. So, That's beautiful. Anyway. I, I do know that when we're attached to an outcome, that's where suffering is, is caused, definitely. When we think things need to go right. a certain way, and they don't, that's when we suffer. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> When we become attached to that promotion or if we become attached to buying this thing, this boat, or when we become attached to getting an award, uh, what have you, or to be recognized in some earthly way. And when we have hundreds of thousands of those attachments, um, life can be pretty consuming and overwhelming, I would think. Yeah, I have a funny story for you. Just two days ago, I lost my passport. And I'm going on an international oh. trip on Friday. And from a victim point of view, I got really pissed off. And I got mad sure. at myself. And I, I don't know. Somehow I became the passerby. And I thought, you know, what if there's a gift in here? What if I'm meant to get a new passport and that person I would deal with just lost a loved one and I can make a difference? What if I'm meant to really clean my room? And so it had me totally clean my room. What you know? So I just tried to look at, as this being a gift, as opposed to this, you know, not being attached to a certain outcome. And believe it or not, I I went to bed at night and I said, okay, who's ever listening, give me some insight as to where this passport is, because I've got the room clean. I understand I'm here to help people, but you know, enough is enough. And so, Roy, I woke up the next morning with the thought, look under the couch. 
And I thought, under the couch, that's insane. <laughs> and so I went downstairs and I just opened up just so I could look under the couch. It's a sectional couch. And lo and behold, just right between the two top cushions, there was my passport. <laughs> Ah, yeah. see, by, by letting go and opening yourself up to the spirit in a loving, open way, your spiritual guides were able to guide you to it through the gentle nudge. Yeah, and I, and I just, I had a good laugh out of it too, you know, but it took something because yeah. I could have been angry the whole time. Oh my. I love that example. That, that perfectly illustrates what I'm talking about. And if we live our lives this way, our lives be so much more fulfilling and we're able to focus on others and love and complete our mission, our task that we're supposed to do here on earth. So that's beautiful. Yeah. And it sure feels good to love, by the way. Anytime I know that I'm out making a difference or listening to someone or sharing, even being with you right now, I'm just, I'm present to love and that feels good. And I, I also heard Absolutely. somebody say that ego stands for edging God out. Um, and I love oh, that. Oh, I love that. Yeah. That's edging. wonderful. I'm going to use that you if you can. don't mind. No, I stole it from somebody else. Um, but it makes perfect sense. And, and it's so easy to get caught up in the me syndrome and thinking life is about me and, and, and forgetting like who we are. And I, I do think we all have that little voice inside of our head that... As much as I might curse it, because sometimes it says I'm not good enough and, you know, I don't matter and all this stuff, um, it, it kind of has me play the human game where I, um, where it is an education for my soul. I think uh, that, that we do need to forget it sometimes and so we can have these breakthroughs and have these learning experiences. But um, but I love things like your book, uh bringing me back home, bringing me back to what's important. And you know, our time's going by fast. Could you tell us a little bit more about the book and then maybe how we can get in, you know, buy the book and also get in touch with you and find out more about you? Oh, absolutely. Well, um, the book kind of covers a lot of the things we discussed today. So if the topics intrigue your listeners, I would encourage you to uh, get the book if you want to go deeper into these matters. Tell us the name of the I book use, again, Roy. Uh, it's Psychology in the Near-Death Experience, Searching for God, and is not a book about psychology. So I almost didn't even include that title because I was afraid that people would be, uh, you know, pushed mm -hmm. off by the title thinking, oh, this is, you know, this is a psychology book. It's not. It's a spiritual book. But it is unique in that I use psych my knowledge of psychology, as you probably heard today in different points, mm -hmm. to help explain some of the human behavior involved with being here on Earth versus a near-death experience. Uh, for instance, the perceptual things of seeing by versus knowing um, comes from my understanding of, of, of psychology. But it is a spiritual book, and the whole purpose is to help people learn how to love and not fear death at its heart, and to connect with our, with the divine. Um, so these, these are the, the underlying messages. Now, it, it is a book that I think has people thinking. Uh, it's not a easy book in the sense that it, it's things aren't sort of spoon fed. But for those true spiritual seekers who are looking to get into the meat of the matter, I think it'll be a good book for you. I like. So, uh, how you get a hold of it? It's on Amazon.com. It is on BarnesandNoble.com. It's on Apple iTunes. So you have the book version. You have the Kindle version. Uh, so you go any of those places. You can go on my website. Which and on is? the website, I have quotes, yes. And my website is neardeathexpsy.com. So, again, that's neardeathexpsy, exp for experience and psy for psychology. Oh, that's perfect. So I want you to get on there. Um, have a lot of cool stuff, um, quotes and things. You do have a lot of resources cool, cool stuff. And also for our listener, 
as a hub, you can go to we don't die radio.com, episode 98 for Roy Hill. And also, I have all the links to his book and his website and everything. You do have some great quotes. I, I, I wrote down one that you have there. Many people believe that they live in a cold, indifferent universe. In reality, everyone is always integrated with God, whether they know it or not. Moreover, yes. everyone has the ability to communicate with the divine through soul. You've got a lot of um, great quotes that gave me goosebumps when I read them. So a lot of good stuff on your website. Roy, any... Thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you. Any closing words or any tidbits of wisdom that you could give us to lead a better day today? Or, I mean, you've said a lot, and so I know I'm concentrating on loving more, but just anything final you want to say? Well, um, I'd like to bring it back to the title of your program. We do not die. And Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, a famous psychiatrist who did the five stages of death, and most, most of your listeners probably heard of that. Mm -hmm. She worked with near-death experience and death and dying for most of her life. And she said that every single patient who had a near-death experience in her line of work completely lost their fear of death, 100%. And that's been pretty much my experience as well. So I would say, without the fear and death, go boldly into the world to love, fulfill your mission, and live a beautiful, meaningful life. This, this life, as tough as it is, can be beautiful. Yes, it certainly can. Oh, Roy, thank you so much for being our guest today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Oh, yeah, me too. I, you know, I, I say that these radio shows are for other people, but you know what? They're also for me because <laughs> yeah. I am a human being having me a human, human experience. And, you know, I always say I want to get my money's worth out of life. So I, I love just what you have con contributed to us today that it just kind of gets us back on track. Uh, and to our listener, thank you for taking the time to listen. Boy, I appreciate you being here for so many episodes. Oh, Roy, I just got a few emails. Some people have listened to every single one of these episodes. And this is episode 98. And this is, this is big. But it, it just to help, I'm here to help empower you on your life. And same as Roy, let you know that um, death is an illusion. We don't die. We go on. Your life is for a reason. Uh, and if you've enjoyed any of these shows, which I'm hoping you do, if you wouldn't mind at some point going to iTunes and just click checking, going into We Don't Die and uh, maybe leaving a review or leaving a star, you can leave one to five stars, and it just helps other people know that this show is of value. And also, you feel free to share it on Facebook, Twitter, all those social media sites. Uh, again, our website is wedontdieradio.com. And in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain. I have been your host on this episode of We Don't Die Radio, and I do believe with all my heart and soul that life is an education for our souls and that your life here on earth is important so in some of the words that roy shared today in god we trust we might not have the answers but trust i love god shines through our cracks know you are an infinite soul you are incredibly loved you have support around you but uh, and that you won't die. So thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.